And today we're in our conversation, we're in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And so if you have a Bible, whether it's in paper or digital form, uh, turn to chapter 1, look at verse 7. Their verses will also be on the screen for those of you who are tuning in online or behind me on the screen for those of you who just want to read along. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation starting at verse 7, halfway through verse 7 really. And this is what Paul, Silas, and Timothy Right. It says, when the Lord appears from heaven, okay, so you're talking about the return of Christ. When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Let me say that again. When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. Now, in these verses, there are three things that we can notice and we're told about Jesus' re return. And the first thing is this. Write this down, point number one in your app notes. Jesus will be revealed with the mighty angels. Jesus will be revealed with the mighty angels. You know, depending upon what translation of the Bible you use, different words are used to sort of articulate this action of Jesus' return. Uh, in my Bible, it says when he comes back. Uh, some of yours might say return, but regardless, what's in, what's, what I want you to capture is that in the Greek language, which was the original language of the New Testament portion of our Bible, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who are the authors of this letter, when describing Jesus' return to earth and accompanied, being accompanied here by these mighty angels, as we're told here in verse 7, the word that he, they use in the Greek language is the word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. Now give me your verbal feedback, okay? Let me hear from you. In the English language, what English word does this Greek word apocalypsis sound like? Apocalyptic. You're right. Apocalypsis. Apocalypse. In the ling English language, what is the definition of an apocalypse? Now, would you agree with me when I suggest that an apocalypse could describe an event that involves perhaps a catastrophic destruction on a global stage? You know, some might even say, suggest that the, the word apocalypse, when used, references the complete and final destruction of the world. As many of you know, the Bible describes some of the events that will take place leading up to the return of Christ. And one of those events, and we're going to unpack that in, in, in weeks to come, involves this global war. In fact, if you read in the book of Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, when the Bible describes this global war between good and evil, it describes as this final battle, and the word that it uses to describe this final battle, this global war that's going to take place on Israeli soil, which is why the nation of Israel is such a big deal in, in, in our world, it's the word Armageddon. You ever heard that word? It's the only place in the Bible that's used. It's only used one time, and it's used to describe this final global war, this apocalyptic war. When Jesus, when God the Father, through the leadership of his resurrection son, when Jesus comes back and puts an end once and for all to sin. Now friends, what, the, what, what Paul, Silas, and, and Timothy want these Thessalonica Christians to know, what they want you and me to know, is that when Jesus is returned from heaven 
to earth and is accompanied by these holy angels or these mighty angels, it will be an apocalyptic event. It will be with, understand this, apocalyptic power. Every false prophet will be, be obliterated. You know, we talk about this, and the Bible talks about this, that when Christ comes back, as the, as the days arrive for him to return, there's going to be false prophets that are going to raise up, and they're going to do demonstrative miracles, and they're going to say, I'm the Messiah, follow me, and people are going to be hoodwinked by that. But what we need to know is what the Bible writer is telling us is that when Christ comes back, it's going to be with this apocalyptic Armageddon kind of power that there's going to be no mistake who he is and when he comes. So we're told here that Jesus' return will be with apocalypsis, with apocalyptic power accompanied by his mighty angels. Number two. A second thing that we're told here in verse 8 is that Jesus will return with flaming fire. Point number two in your app notes. Jesus will return with flaming fire. Show of hands, how many of you enjoy watching, watching the flickering flames of a fire? Anybody? Me too. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of fire that maybe, you know, burns down a building or, or you know, kind of consummates or consumes a forest fire. I'm talking about like a, a campfire, right? Or if many of you, if you've ever been over to Stephen Robbins' house, they have this beautiful fire pit in the backyard. Nothing better than just sitting around the, the fire pit at night watching those, those, those flames flicker. I find, and I suspect many of you do too, in my opinion, fire... And the flickering flames of fire are mesmerizing. Would you agree with that? Some might even suggest that they're majestic. And so Jesus, we're told, will re return with flaming fire. And so my translation of what I envision Jesus returning with this, this apocalyptic power is that it's going to be mesmerizing. When Jesus returns with his, his angels in, with flaming fire, it's going to be majestic. But don't miss this. Jesus' apocalyptic return and his apocalyptic activity will also be purifying. Most of you likely know that once when, when ore is dug out of the ground, that intense heat will be used to separate the dross. It will be used to separate sort of the scum from the internal metal, the silver and the gold that is contained within that, that rock formation. Why? Because fire is purifying. And throughout the Bible, we can read how God will use fire in a figurative way to purify us. Times of testing are allowed into our lives in order to strengthen and develop our character, which helps shape us into the person that God wants us to be. Just this morning, David was, we were sitting, you know, before the service and talking about the, the, the impact that this, this accident in his family has had upon his, his faith already. And, and how it, he, we were talking about what, how he might have responded had his dad and brother and sister and the other 37 people, had they lost their lives when the bus tipped over. Fire is purifying. Fire shapes us. And I just want to say to you that if you're in a season of fire right now or you're a season where you feel like God is shaping you right now, don't lose hope. You know, don't give in to despair. Trust that God has got you. In faith, trust that he is walking with you. Why? Because fire can be purifying. Show of hands, how many of you got a chance to listen this past week to President Donald Trump when he talked about the assassination attempt on his life? Anybody get a chance to see that? You know, as I was watching, you know, the, on a side note, President Trump, to have someone shoot you in the head is life-changing. And, you know, anytime there's an accident or something goes wrong, everybody wants to know the details, right? 
And everybody's asking questions. And what? Don't, don't ever forget that every time you ask somebody, and every time, I love the fact that President Trump said, I'm only going to tell this story once. Why? Because every time you tell the story, you're reliving the experience, and you're re-traumatizing re yourself every time. It's like you're going back to that terrific place. That's the danger of, I just, I rarely ask people the details of, of a situation because I recognize that it traumatizes them. But on Thursday, you know, of, of, the, of the, this past week, the Republicans, uh, you know, had this convention. And when you, when you saw him walk out, he just, to me, he just looked different. And as I listened to his, his, his recount this, this story of, of this assassination attempt on his life last weekend, President Trump, in his testimony, expressed how his faith had been, in God, had been reinforced through this tragedy. You know, he shared how this near-death experience changed his perspective about what really matters in life, right? And as he spoke, you could hear the humility in the tone of his words. And as I mentioned already, on his face, he, ju he just looked differently. And, and, and I thought, that's, that's common. That's, that's what one would expect. Friends, fire is purifying. And when Jesus comes back, accompanied by his mighty angels with flaming fire, we are told that his apocalyptic return will be transformative. At the same time, fire is destructive, isn't it? Fire can tr cause tremendous carnage, can it? And the Bible writers, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, want their readers to know, they want you and I to know, that when Jesus and his angels return with flaming fire, that Jesus is going to deliver judgment that has everlasting consequences. Point number three in your notes. Jesus' apocalyptic return will usher in a judgment that has eternal consequences. Look again at verse 7. He said, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. You know, one of the things that captures my attention here in these Bible verses is where we are told that everlasting destruction and flaming fire judgment awaits those who reject Jesus. And so for the remainder of this conversation, I want you and I encourage you and I invite you to ponder this question as we talk about and maybe unpack what God's judgment is. And the question is this, what will hell be like? You ever thought about that? If Jesus' apocalyptic return is going to usher in everlasting destruction and a forever separation from him for those who reject Jesus, what will their eternal existence entail? What will hell be like? Well, to answer that question, remember what we always say, use the Bible to answer questions about the Bible. I want you to turn back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read a couple of uh, passages from Matthew. These are sermons that Jesus wrote. And in Matthew chapter 13, in fact, it's at the, at the beginning uh, of 13. We're going to go skip down to verse 24. Matthew 13, 24, where Jesus is talking about the end times and what is going to happen. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, this is what Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's, workers went to, the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Well, should we pull out the weeds, they asked. 
No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat. If you do, let both grow toward together until the harvest, and then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Skip down to verse 36. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into his house, and his disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus said, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where, be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now skip down to verse 47. Again, verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That's the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now skip forward in your Bibles to chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25. Now we looked at verse, the first part of this chapter earlier when, remember, I, I, I um, introduced to you our logo where we talked about the ten virgins? That's in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. I want you to skip down to verse 31, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is still talking about heaven. He's talking about his apocalyptic return, and he's telling us what to look for and what's going to be involved. So verse 31 of Matthew 25, the final judgment Jesus is talking about. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, that's exactly what we just read in 2 Thessalonians, wasn't it? Jesus is going to be, come back with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. Then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Skip down to verse 41. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones. Now catch this. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Friends, one of the things that captures my attention here in these verses is this truth that God has created hell for the devil and his demons. That's the first thing I want you to know about hell, point number one there in your notes. Hell is a place that was created for the devil and his demons. Friends, God never intended for humanity to spend eternity in hell. When God created human, humankind, he created us in his image. He did not intend for humanity to spend our everlasting days in hell. Hell was not created for you or me. But rather, according to what Jesus tells us here in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, hell and the eternal fires of hell was originally created for who? The devil and his demons. By the way, did you know that Jesus talks more about hell and judgment than any other person in the entire Bible? It's a big deal. Jesus wants us to know. And here in Matthew chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 25, Jesus taught that because of the devil's influence, 
And because of the, sin, the devil's sinister seed planting, that those who reject Jesus are basically aligning themselves with the devil and his demons. They're joining sort of the devil's campaign and consequently they will then join the devil and his demons in this terrible place. Friends, hell is a place reserved for those who rebel against and reject God. Hell, the Bible teaches, is a place where every false prophet and every enemy of God will spend eternity. And if, if for what it's worth, my opinion is hell is a place to avoid. Number two, a second thing that Jesus tells us about hell that I think is important for you and I to understand is that hell is a place of never-ending fire. Hell is a place of never-ending fire. Now, full disclosure, theologians don't all agree with this. Some people say that hell is, is, is a literal place of fire. Other people say, it's well, it's figurative because they also talk about how hell is going to have everlasting darkness. And so how can fire, the lights of fire, and the lights of, and, and the non-light of darkness, you know, meet together? And so there's this, this back and forth about what it means. For full disclosure, I think it's a little bit of both. And maybe that's a cop-out. But I don't think it's completely figurative. I think there's this element of it because Jesus tells us here that hell is a place of never-ending fire. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 42 and 50, the Bible informs us that hell is a burning furnace. Jesus taught in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 43, that hell is a place where the fire never goes out. Jesus describes hell as an, an as a unquenchable fire. In the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 20, repeatedly the Bible references hell as a place or describes hell as a lake of fire, as a fiery lake of burning sulfur. How many of you ever smelled sulfur? How many of you like the smell of burning sulfur? No bueno, right? It, it doesn't s smell good. Consequently, number three in your notes, the Bible tells us and teaches us that hell is a place of never-ending suffering. In hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which we just read. Hell, the Bible teaches, is a place where sin and death will be eternally sent. It will be a place of suffering. And number four, hell is a place of never-ending isolation. Hell is a place of never-ending isolation. Yes, the devil is going to be there. Yes, the demons will be there. Yes, those people who reject Jesus are going to be there. But friends, it's not going to be a party. It's not going to be a class reunion where you get to go and hang out with all of your friends. It will be a place of isolation. In Revelation chapter, or rather in the, we read earlier in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9, how with Jesus' apocalyptic return, those who reject God will be sent to hell. And they will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of God and from the glory of his joy and his love and his never-ending blessings. You know, in a recent survey, did you know that only 58% of people believe that there's a hell? And of those 58% of people, so one, 58 people out of 100 people believe in hell, and only 2% believe that they're going to go there. But according to the Bible, hell is a real place that those who reject Jesus will be sent. Do you think that, you know, if you think that this world is bad now, wait until you go to a place where God removes his presence. Friends, I propose that hell is not a place that you or I want to spend our eternity. Why? Because hell was never created for us. But for those who choose sin, selfishness, immorality, and unbelief, the Bible teaches us that hell will be their final destination. This is not my teaching. This is what Jesus says. 
This is what the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords warns us, and he taught about it extensively. There's a man by the name of Paul Copen. He's a philosopher. Uh, he's the professor of ethics at, in, in Florida at Palm Beach Atlantic University. He's a visiting scholar at Oxford University, and, and he's a, really a leading authority on the subject of hell. And in In an interview that I I read between him and another person, he said this, and I I quote. He said, if God is the cosmic authority, we should expect his ways and standards to be infinitely more finely tuned than our own limited moral perceptions. Our perspective may be skewed by our own self-interest or because our cultural lenses could cloud our notions of justice and fairness. Translation, we might be tempted to minimize the reality of hell. Friends, if Jesus promoted the concept of hell, I urge you to believe in him. Jesus basically said, repent or perish, right? And so I close with this. This coming Saturday... As most of you know, Robin and I are going to be setting out on a 4,000-mile motorcycle trip. Our final destination, or our intended destination, is the Sturgis, is Sturgis, South Dakota, where there is this annual motorcycle rally that will take place. Now, every time I ride my motorcycle, and particularly go on a road trip like this, I'm especially mindful of the the truth that I am risking my life. Riding motorcycles can be risky. Any time that you put gasoline and high speeds, any time that you ride a rocket, it can be dangerous. I recognize that. That's what makes it so much fun. But I recognize that as Rob and I set out on this cross-country journey that if we hit a deer on some Montana roadway, and it's not uncommon for us to be going down the road, and they're right there along the edges eating grass. You see them if you've ever driven in the mountains. They're right there, and just sometimes they run out in front of you, you know, and their feet are they're slipping on the, on the asphalt. Or, you know, you, we know a couple years ago we hit a bear, and so it, it's a reality. If we happen to hit one of these wonderful crea- creatures of God, or maybe we experience a tire blowout while going around some Colorado mountain curve and go over the cliff, This could be my final sermon that I ever preached to you. And I always think about that, as grim as that might be, when I go on these trips. And so if that is true, if this is the last time I ever get to speak to you here at Palm Harvest Church, I urge you that if you have never given your, if you have not yet asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, that you do so today. Because if you don't, your final destination will be hell, and hell is not where you or I want to be. Heaven is. You know, people often ask, why would a loving God send a person to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves to hell when we choose to reject Jesus. And God I propose reluctantly lets us go there. The Bible teaches, friends, and I'll close with this. David, come on up. That we're all sinners. I don't think most of us here today probably would deny that truth. But the Bible also teaches that when we confess our sins and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is King and Lord and we invite him into our life, the Bible teaches us that we will be saved. Somebody say amen to that. And so the question that I, again, ask you to consider today, is Jesus your Lord? Have you invited him to be your Savior? Today we're going to receive communion. We're going to practice communion. It's the, it's the, it's the thing that Jesus did. You know, he, he, he sat down with his disciples for one final meal. He served them this, this Passover meal involving the bread and the wine. And in our case, we serve grape juice. 
But then, then he, you know, after he was done, the Bible talks about how he put this towel around his waist and he began to, you know, he was washing the disciples' feet. He's going, see what I've done to you? The whole purpose of this communion is for you to serve people and to love people, to lay your life down for people. And so as we receive communion, there's this introspective element of saying, Lord, please forgive me and please cleanse me and please continue to transform me. At the same time, there's also this element of saying, God, please empower me to serve people. Please empower me to, 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 you know, to serve people with open hands and not a a closed fist. And so I'm going to have, as Joe and Lisa, are you guys serving today? Would you get up, please? As they go to the back, before we go, join them, I want us to say three prayers together to get, uh, today, and I'm going to lead you in them. So let's put yourself in a posture of prayer. Open the palms up and just set them open on your, hand, on your lap if, if that's comfortable for you. And take a deep breath in. Just inhale. As you inhale, just say, Lord, fill me up more of you. And as you exhale, just say less of me couple of deep breaths, more of you, less of me. Now in your heart and in your mind, would you pray this? Would you say, Jesus, please forgive me. And say, Jesus, please transform me. And lastly, I encourage you to pray, Jesus, please save a place for me in heaven. Because that's where I want to go. So brothers and sisters, I bless you today with an increased capacity to love those in your world who are hard to love. I bless you with an overwhelming and a measure and a capacity that even surprises you how you can love the difficult people in your circles. I bless you with an an ever-flowing, never-ending sense of joy that will be contagious. I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. Have a good week. We'll see you next week, Palm Harvest.